This webinar uh, is uh, presented by Don Williams of Optical Scientific. We'll be talking about optical flow sensors for environmental compliance and process control. Uh, during the webinar, if you have a question, you can click on the little show conversation icon on the upper right hand side and type in a question and I will monitor those questions and at the end of the webinar I will ask uh, Don the questions that uh, come up during uh, the course of the webinar. If there's something that you believe is very relevant, sorry about that dingy, um, then you can raise your hand. There's a little hand with an icon uh, by a smiley face. Uh, click on that. I will see that and then you can jump in and ask the question uh, contemporaneous with the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Don. And again, thank you very much for presenting today. OK, well, thank you for for having me. Um, Looking forward to the opportunity. Uh, I assume everybody can see the uh, the briefing slide. Is that correct? Correct. OK, good. OK, uh, there's a fair number of slides in this presentation, but uh, not to worry uh, about half of them or photographs, just uh, application examples. So we can uh, breeze through those pretty quick. OK, today I'll give an overview of uh, what is optical scintillation, which is the technology behind our sensors, uh, give you a bit of a history of scintillation based sensors. Uh, we'll go into the OFS description and overview uh, and we'll compare OFS with other flow technologies that uh, you might be a little more used to. Uh, we'll talk about the range of different OFS applications and the technology advantages of this type of uh, simulation based technology and of course we'll summarize and have some question and answer at the end uh, a lot of people think that this is new technology but it's actually been in use for over 40 years and we've had other sensors based on the same technology so what is optical simulation if if you look at the, the little red dot there, it's a, a point source, a, a beam of light, if you will, uh, spreading out from a point uh, where there is no turbulence or distortion of any kind, like in a vacuum, you would have a nice smooth wave front. But when the light goes through the atmosphere or gas with turbulence, that sort of thing, it gets distorted, uh, wrinkled, if you will. And uh, instead of a nice round spot at the other end, if you were projecting to a wall, you would have an image that would look more like this. So if that were in a vacuum, it'd be a nice round spot. But in the atmosphere, it's uh, it's distorted. Turbulence is what causes that distortion, and that is caused by either different densities of gases mixing and distorting the, the optical path or by bubbles or, or eddies of hot and cold different temperature gases uh, that distort the, the beam like that. And this next one is going to be uh, a photo of a uh, laser basically propagating uh, through the atmosphere to a, a special camera. It was uh, set up by the Army Research Lab and it's a real good illustration of how the OFS literally sees air movement. Uh, you can clearly see it's moving from right to left and if you look at it for a while you'll notice that all that turbulence isn't moving at the same rate. Some of it's moving slower, some of it's moving faster. So this is why it's important to, if you if you want to accurately measure uh, wind flow, gas flow, uh, you can't use a point sensor like a pitot tube. Uh, you need a, a full path average measurement. 
The first sensor that we built based on this uh, technology was called the LOA, Long Baseline Optical Anemometer. Uh, and it was basically a uh, LED uh, infrared transmitter uh, with a photo detector receiver, two of them. And as the air moves through the beam, that turbulence introduces a, uh, a scintillation signal, we call it. And we do some processing to detect the rate of speed that uh, the air is moving past the two detectors. So basically it's like a, uh, uh, just a, a, a gauge for measuring time of flight, kind of like a uh, tachometer. Now this sensor was uh, developed for the aluminum industry. Uh, I'll tell you a little more about that uh, later. But as far as the, the scintillation, technology. Here's another way to, to look at it. Uh, each of the detectors were taking 4,000 data points in a 0.3 second time frame, and we're looking at how those two sets of data change from A to B as the, as the air moves past it. Uh, you can see there's a, there's a signal there in A and it does change, but it still maintains some similar characteristics in the other side. So by measuring this time delay, and we have a known distance of separation, we know what the, the true flow velocity is. Here's another uh, way of looking at it. The uh, signals that uh, we're detecting, they're in the audio frequency range basically from a few hertz up to maybe 15 or 20 kilohertz. Now a typical flow signature would have a lot more noise and and much more signal, but this is just like a single puff, if you will. And again, you can see in the A detector, the closer one, it shows up first and in some time delay later, you see it in the B detector. So scintillation based sensors have a, a long history. Like I mentioned, it's it's been around for over 40 years measuring crosswind and turbulence. Uh, the folks that are primarily interested in turbulence are like uh, laser weapons, uh, dispersion modeling, uh, using corrective algorithms to improve imaging, uh, that sort of thing. Our first production sensor the LOA is actually the predecessor to the OFS. It's a much larger system and it, uh, the transmitter and receiver are separated by up to 10 kilometers. So it would measure the crosswind through that 10 kilometer path. And it was approved for, uh, by EPA for method 14 emissions. And this is what the, the receiver looks like. And in this case, it's oriented vertically. And this is where they were initially used in aluminum pot rooms. Uh, typically 500 meters or so long, some of them up to a mile. Uh, there are these large, long, skinny buildings with a series of smelting pots. And as aluminum is processed, it uh, releases hydrogen fluoride, and that's what's going up through roof vents in the top of the building. And of course, EPA wants to know how much of that stuff you're putting out, because if you put out too much and the atmosphere can't digest it, you get acid rain. So anything they put in that path to try and measure it, like a propeller type or uh, ultrasonic uh, anemometer would just corrode in a matter of weeks. So the LOA was brought in and we put the transmitter at one end of the building and our dual receiver at the other end and it watches that turbulent air flow up through the optical path and gives a very accurate reading of uh, the velocity. And there's what a actual pot room looks like.
the LOA was later used for uh, measuring wake vortex at airports. Uh, this was actually, this is a live photo, it's not a Photoshop job. Uh, NASA had a test trailer out there, and these are a couple of our sensors up there. And there were other sensors here as well. They had six different technologies trying to measure wake vortex, uh, which is the, the little uh, turbulence that comes off of the tips of uh, larger jets. And it can cause problems for smaller planes. Well, the, the six or so technologies they tested, uh, none of them really worked continuous. They had a couple that they could take the data, go back and analyze it and say, yep, here's a wake vortex. But ours was the only one that worked 24 seven continuous. And you didn't need a PhD setting at the uh, screen to, to interpret it. So this technology was so successful in these uh, other programs that the uh, EPA asked us, could we shrink that and put it on a stack? And we said, yeah, sure. And that's how the OFS was born. Uh, this is just another version of the LOA. Uh, in this case, we put the transmitter on the top there and the two receivers at the bottom. So all three items are in one housing and we shoot to a retro reflector uh, up to 300 uh, uh, meters away and we can measure the uh, crosswinds and turbulence that way. So the OFS, uh, same kind of concept. There's a transmitter. In this case, we emit a visible red beam so it's easy to see. It's eye safe uh, and uh, it's you'll note it's diverging. The reason for that is so that minor changes in alignment won't create problems. Uh, and we use a LED for that same reason. If we were to use laser, uh, you would have a lot more pointing and vibration problems. So the, uh, the partially coherent LED is a much better source in this case for this technology. Okay, so here's the block diagram of the OFS itself. Very, very similar to the LOA. Basically, just miniaturized the uh, the heads, and all the signal processing is done in a basically a single DSP board. Uh, the outputs are we have various serial outputs, uh, Modbus, RTU, or uh, just RS232, and then we've got uh, current loop outputs. So we've got the, the two heads, the transmitter receiver. Uh, each one of the heads has a extension spool piece that will mount to your uh, test port, or your uh, four inch port, and uh, uses a standard 150 pound four inch flange, although we can provide different spools to, to different size, like three inch or six inch or whatever. Uh, the control box, which can be either a, a rack mount or a NEMA type enclosure, uh, contains all the DSP electronics and power supplies and so forth. And they, uh, the NEMA box and the heads can be uh, made suitable for hazardous area with use of a Z-purge. So that's done in a lot of the uh, flare applications. So here's a just a photograph of the rack and the uh, the NEMA four type control box and one of the heads. Here's the typical stack installation. And you'll notice there's a purge air being applied to the spool piece. Uh, that's to basically create kind of a high pressure front so that if there happens to be a lot of particulate and dirt, uh, oily substance uh, in the media, then it doesn't accumulate in the head. Uh, one thing I'll explain in more detail, but uh, dirty windows and that sort of thing uh, is not really a problem for this technology. And I'll get into that a little more later on. 
Here's a typical flare installation. You can see there's a gap right there between the head and the instrument spool. And inside there is a sight glass cartridge. So that's one of the benefits of this technology. We don't need to stick anything into the flow. So we don't care how hot it is, how corrosive it is, you know, whatever. Uh, we just need to look through it. And here's a typical uh, flare installation. It's a little, little hard to make that out, but you can, you can see the sight glass here, and then there's a gate valve. Um, again, because nothing has to go into the uh, the line or the stack, you can use a uh, hot tap to easily install these without a shutdown. And installation itself is very simple. Uh, we do offer, you know, provide our support engineers out there to help you with startup and that sort of thing. But most users do a self install. Uh, it's that easy. We've got the uh, good fortune to be located in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So our equipment is not NIST traceable, it's NIST tested. We're like a mile away from NIST. Uh, so we've had our uh, OFS in their uh, wind tunnel as well. And you can see pointing is not critical. It, here we've got them sitting on a cart with a block of foam underneath. Uh, and the two transmitters are shooting across to receivers on the other side. So that just kind of indicates how uh, forgiving the alignment is. And here's the, uh, the data that we got from that test. Uh, we've got complete test reports we can uh, send to anybody by email if you're interested. Uh, but you can see it's extremely linear. Uh, the test facility at NIST has an array of uh, something on the order of 120 or 130 pitot tubes, and each one has individual temperature compensation. Uh, so they take the average of the wind across that array of pitot tubes, and the agreement with ours is very good. The only problem is their stops down here at around uh, one or two meters per second, uh, ours goes virtually to zero. It's much more sensitive. So the characteristics of the technology, um, system is not sensitive to dirty optics or high opacity. As long as we can get just a percent or two of the light through, uh, it'll work according to specifications. Uh, and that's because we're looking at fluctuations in light. We're not looking at absolute intensity. Uh, the other advantage is it's non-intrusive to media flow, so there's nothing to clog. Uh, there's no probes to worry about uh, uh, being damaged by temperatures too high or, or by acidic gases. Uh, and as well, since you don't stick anything into it, uh, you don't create a pressure drop, which can be, you know, pretty important in certain critical processes. Uh, the measurement is a true cross stack line average, much more representative than a single point or, or even a couple discrete points. And with this technology, we can handle complex flow patterns uh, much better than, say, an angled uh, technology like ultrasonic and it does have built-in daily or programmable how often you want calibration and uh, continuous performance monitoring the technology is not subject to the typical error mechanisms that other technologies are uh, changes in temperature pressure humidity density path length uh, turbulent flow None of that is uh, an error mechanism for us. It is for other things like pitot tubes and uh, ultrasonic. Uh, the measurement is based on light and the time of flight. So we don't have the limitations of uh, speed of sound or minimum pressure differentials, those kind of limitations. 
Uh, if Microsoft wouldn't sue us, we'd call it plug and play because it is very easy to install. Uh, there's no piping, repiping needed uh, for most applications. Uh, your, your typical ultrasonic, you're going to need 30 diameters of uh, straight run in order to get near laminar flow. We don't want laminar flow. We want turbulent flow because that's our signal. And so you, you've got places where you might only have uh, a couple of diameters uh, of straight run. We can install in those places. And if you're talking about a, a stack, then that means you only need one platform because we shoot straight across. We don't have to shoot at a 45 degree angle. And as well, since the uh, system is based on DSP, uh, there's no analog drift. So we, uh, the technology itself, the OFS meet uh, EPA method 14, uh, 40 CFR, part 60, 75. Uh, we're in JJA applications, uh, a lot of different uh, certifications. And like I mentioned, it's not NIST uh, traceable, it's NIST tested. So for, for your ideal flow meter, you would want it to have a cross stack line average uh, because it's more representative than single points. Um, you want a single velocity profile uh, to be measured in that, uh, that path. If your path is on a 45 degree angle, that profile is changing as it moves along the pipe or stack. So you're actually measuring through multiple profiles. Uh, it may be a minor thing or it may be a very significant thing and, and it leads to uh, errors. Since there's nothing to insert, you won't get any kind of caking on, on your ideal flow meter uh, and you won't create a pressure drop with it. Uh, the ideal sensor should also be solid state, high mean time between failure. Uh, you don't want things that have trim pots or you know potentiometers you have to get in there and adjust every year or whatever. And again, the ideal meter should not be dependent on the type of gas um, or whether there's uh, saturated water, temperatures uh, that might vary. Uh, all of those things are issues with a number of other technologies. And uh, of course, the ideal flow sensor should have a very wide measurement range. Uh, ours goes from 0.03 to 170 meters per second. So it's well over a 5,000 uh, to one turndown ratio. So talking about some of the other technologies, uh, ultrasonic uh, is based on the speed of sound. So when you're talking about high flow rates, uh, there's a nonlinear shockwave effect that limits accuracy. And at very low flow rates, uh, the accuracy is reduced because the, the flow rate becomes a very tiny fraction of the speed of sound. So it's a sampling issue. Uh, pitot tubes a lot of times are limited just by noise and electronic resolution and also they have a, a problem with low flow rates. Uh, there's not enough of a pressure difference to get an accurate measurement. And any kind of insertion probe that you want to use is potentially plagued by clogging and they're basically at the uh, uh, you know, subject to the, the environmental extremes themselves, like whether it's acidic or, or too high of a temperature or whatever. So none of these things affect OFS. Here's something you don't want to see is a point measurement probe caked with uh, who knows what that is, <laughs> but you wouldn't want to see that on your uh, flow meter. And with uh, airfoils, uh, you get a tremendous amount of back pressure as well as uh, 
you know, ports to be uh, plugged up. Here's a, this is just an example of typical uh, stability and reliability for OFS. Uh, this plant had uh, two OFS installed on the two stacks you see there and went uh, over 10 years without touching them, not cleaning the windows, not doing anything. And that's not unusual. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, applications that are like that. So regarding placement for the OFS versus ultrasonic, uh, our basic requirements are one and two diameters, uh, whereas for ultrasonic, you're talking 10 and 20, and you are going through a slanted path, so the ultrasonic is measuring through multiple changing flow profiles. So that's another source of, of error. And if you're on some kind of stack, that means you need two platforms, which I'm not sure what they cost, but I wouldn't be surprised if you're talking a couple hundred thousand. Uh, we need one instead of two. So the placement advantages, uh, we can be located in or near bends. Uh, if there's a uh, a difficult situation where you've got maybe multiple uh, ducks feeding uh, the bottom of a stack and it might create some swirl or or varying flow uh, profiles, then we can put uh, two sensors in the next pattern. Uh, same thing if uh, we're on, say, a flare line and there's a chance of stratification, then we can mount two or three sensors at different heights along that, uh, that pipe. And because we're, we can be used behind sight glasses, uh, that's a, a great thing for, for both reliability and maintenance and uh, personal safety. Here's an example of some data taken on a 24 inch flare line uh, what I want to point out is down here, you can see the sensitivity. We're, we're talking here 0 0.3, 0 0.4 feet per second. So it's got a very wide dynamic range. Comparing the different technologies, uh, I won't go through this in great detail, but you can see the, the optical flow sensor technology does have an advantage over all the other technologies in all these different categories. Uh, the only one place uh, where ultrasonic has a bit of an advantage is we our technology cannot measure density of the gas. Uh, the ultrasonic has to know the density of the gas and and can calculate it based on you know traveling through the speed of sound and so forth so it does give you a, a course uh, it's not a very accurate but it, it'll give you a, a course uh, reading of what the the gas density is and generally that's not an issue because you've got other devices measuring gas concentration and, and so forth. So uh, one thing that I did not put on this chart is uh, applications like high hydrogen. Uh, the optical flow sensor can measure in virtually pure hydrogen. Uh, the other technologies will not. OK, so some of the typical applications uh, we're in power plants, uh, incinerators, chemical manufacturers, uh, pulp and paper, uh, primary metal manufacturing, uh, of course, refining. Uh, a lot of different types of uh, applications, whether it's uh, stack emissions, uh, flare line emissions, any kind of ducts or pipes, uh, scrubbers, bag houses, uh, boilers and gas turbines, 
uh, process control, combustion efficiency. So we, we pretty much cover uh, the full range of, of applications. And I'll just, I'll scoot through these quite quick because it just shows some different uh, application examples. So here we have power plants. Uh, and let's see, emissions. Here's a uh, pulp and paper and a, and a wet scrubber. Thermal oxidizers. Uh, we're used in oxidizers where uh, they're talking like 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can't do that with an ultrasonic. Here's a stack with ID fans. Uh, we're used on air assist for flares, uh, measuring the, uh, the intake air. Here's uh, some duct applications. Cement plant and a trash burner. Different kind of uh, combustion applications. We are on a couple of uh, these type of applications where they had very, very, you know, like less than a, a, a diameter uh, of straight run. And uh, we place it in the middle and it works fine. So we can even be less than one and two diameters. This next one's a interesting combustion. This is a intake air coming into the stack with a little hat on it. And uh, they tried uh, anti-bar, thermal mass flow, and some kind of laser-based system, and none of them worked. Uh, they finally tried the OFS and it works great. <laughs> Here's another combustion application. Uh, the sensor can be used in bi-directional mode as well. Uh, normally we set it for unidirectional, uh, but if you have a bi-directional application, we can set it up for that. We can be in applications where there's uh, saturated gas. And of course, flares. There's some more flare examples. So just kind of summarizing the technology advantage is uh, the sensor mounts straight across the stack, four inch, 150 pound flange and, and gate valve if necessary. Uh, you can use hot tap to install. They are fully NIST tested. The flare version goes from 0.03 to 170 meters per second. Um, there's no moving parts. Uh, the construction is modular, uh, so it's easy to swap a board. Uh, if something goes down and fails, uh, it's usually a matter of 15 minutes or so to get it back up and running. Uh, no repiping is needed uh, because of the minimal number of diameters we need. Uh, replacement parts and modules, uh, which can be a big issue for some companies, uh, we've got on the shelf. So we can get uh, next or even same day delivery. Uh, current output, uh, four to 20 milliamp. Uh, we've got two outputs on each type of sensor. There's uh, different models. Uh, and as well, we have uh, RS-232 with uh, Modbus RTU capability. Uh, that actually needs corrected. It's not optional, it's in all of them. Uh, we do have on-site training uh, and service. Uh, most of the time, uh, if the instrument techs at a site have gotten the training and a problem comes up, we can solve 90% of the issues uh, with just a little hand holding over the phone. And the uh, controller can be rack mounted or NEMA. Uh, typically, we can turn these around uh, from time of PO. Uh, Two, two to four weeks, uh, more, more commonly towards the three to four weeks, but sometimes we can uh, get them out quite quick. Uh, I believe we're the only uh, company in industry that offers a money back guarantee. Uh, the way the process works, 
the customer sends us a, a, a filled out application profile form uh, that asks questions like what's the path length, what are the temperatures, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, is it a stack or a duct? Uh, if we get that data back, review it and send you a formal quote, that means we guarantee it's going to work in that application. And if it doesn't, we'll take the sensor back and, and give you money back. Uh, the heads uh, never have to be removed or zeroed, uh, so there's no kind of fresh air service needed. And uh, the, the heads, although we do have a, a recommended cleaning period of one to two years for the windows, uh, we've got a lot of customers that don't touch them for many years. Um, and that's because, again, we're looking at fluctuations in light. As long as we can get a cut, you know, one or two percent of that light through, then it'll work. So it doesn't doesn't matter if uh, dirt builds up gradually on the uh, windows. So it's a it's a very well proven technology, mature. Um, We've got over 1,500 fielded, probably about 350 to 400 of those are in flares. Uh, a couple hundred of them are in very uh, difficult applications uh, and uh, you know, high temperature applications, that sort of thing. Uh, it does have a very wide range, high turn down, uh, temperatures, not a problem. Uh, same goes with uh, very low temperatures too, cryogenic temperatures, uh, because there's nothing in the path. So we really don't care what the temperature is. Uh, it's non-insertion, non-contact. Uh, it is a true path average measurement. Uh, skip through a couple of these. Uh, Installation is very easy. Uh, Cost-wise, we're typically talking about 16 to 22 K for a sensor and uh, they're extremely high reliability, uh, extremely low maintenance. Uh, so there's not a not a very high cost of ownership at all. And the technology, because of its nature, it's so versatile, it fits in just about any kind of application. And just an example of uh, some of our users. Uh, we've we've been fielding these for about 20 years. And that is the end of it. Uh, if you have any questions, be glad to try and answer them. Yes, Don, there are multiple questions uh, that were raised. Uh, so um, why not laminar? Uh, does the okay. technology not work during laminar flow? Yeah, our what we're looking at is fluctuations in light uh, that are caused by some kind of turbulence, whether it's thermal turbulence or or blending of gases. Uh, if we had a perfectly homogeneous uh, laminar flow, uh, no temperature variation, uh, which, you know, you can get close to that after about 20 diameters or so, uh, then we wouldn't have any signal. So while everybody else is trying to get away from turbulence, that's our signal. That's what makes this technology so unique and so flexible because it's it's pretty difficult to get true laminar flow and that's that's where the other technologies perform best. I understand. Um, any limitations on composition? Uh, can it handle any gas range? Yeah, it can. It can handle any gas range from pure hydrogen uh, to to whatever kind of mixture, and of course, air as well. Okay, uh, Don, that was a fantastic presentation. Super informative. Um, Thank you. Oh, they, they ask about liquids, if there's uh, particulate liquid droplets entrained in the, in the vapor stream. We've actually got a model. We've, we've got about five different models. Uh, the uh, the w, w model 
is what we call uh, for uh, bag house applications, that sort of thing, uh, where there are potentially uh, entrained water droplets or, or particulates or whatever. So we just, we change the optics slightly uh, so that there's less interference from reflection coming back uh, from the droplets. So yes, we can, we can handle entrained droplets. Uh, the technology itself can actually be used in pure liquid as well, uh, as long as there's either, you know, some, some kind of turbulence in there or whatever. We have not done that to date, but uh, uh, we actually had a, a German company that makes uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, they wanted to use our technology, but the problem was the, uh, it was a pebble bed nuclear reactor and uh, the problem was they couldn't find sight glasses uh, rated high enough to contain the pressure. So, so we had no way of looking through it. <laughs> so, Yes. Glass is amorphous, so it has a limit on pressure, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot during this presentation. It was a fantastic presentation, very well done, very well put together. And thank you, Don, for taking your time today and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Glad so, to share what it's all about. So thank you so very much. And thank you to all of the attendees. And yes. of course, we look forward to seeing you all at the 4C conference, August 18th to the 20th in Austin, Texas. Uh, thanks again, and with that, it concludes the webinar for today. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.